What a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. Thank you, Jesus, that in your name as we sang that song, we saw heavens open and we saw you smiling at us, pleased with what you hear. You are pleased when your sons and daughters lift up your name. And we thank you because hundreds of people, millions of people today are gathered all over the world lifting your name on high. And we pray that if there's anyone in this room today that could not sing that song with their full heart, that you would do the miracle that only you can do today and open blind eyes to see, open deaf ears to hear, and break hard hearts to be healed. I pray now that the anointing of the Spirit will come powerfully upon me so that every word would be anointed by the Spirit to hit at a specific point in people's lives where they meet. We pray that your word, the living double-edged sword, would cut through to bone and marrow and to spirit and soul to reveal our sin and to lead us to salvation. We pray this in your Son's beautiful name. Amen. This is our second week on Sabbath. And last week we ended on the, the note that Sabbath rest, Jesus' Sabbath rest is the climax of our salvation. There is no greater goal, there is no greater purpose than for you and I to find rest. And when God created the world, He instituted the Sabbath to point to the Sabbath that we would find in Jesus. It's all about the Sabbath. Everything is revolving around rest and Sabbath rest. And we know this because Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This is all it's about, people. It's about you and I finding rest and peace and joy and happiness in Jesus. This is all it's about. There's no higher goal. I said last week that the purpose of our salvation is not forgiveness. The purpose of our salvation is not justification. The purpose of our salvation is not even sanctification. Those things are channels for us to enter into the rest. You are forgiven so that you can be with Jesus. You are sanctified so that you can be more and more like Jesus and enjoy the rest that He has. It's all about rest. And last week there was a strong warning word coming from the author of Hebrews in chapter 3 saying, Today, if you hear His voice, do not Harden your hearts. Because people who harden their hearts cannot enter into the rest of Jesus. And last week we saw three points about this. Number one, that Jesus speaks. Jesus speaks to you right now. He's speaking to you right now through me. The words that I'm uttering through my mouth are the words of Jesus coming to you through the word into your heart. He speaks to you right now. He doesn't speak through an intermediary. I am just a channel of His voice, but He speaks to you powerfully, directly through His own Word. And then you are faced with a choice. You can either harden your heart and so remain restless throughout your life, or you can open your heart and then you can receive His Word into your life. And my prayer and the prayer of the worship team and the prayer of all your elders is that you would pray right now that God would soften your heart enough so that you would be able to open it and then receive Him. That's all we're after this morning. But after a word of strong warning 
This author turned now and he speaks a word of exhortation. He speaks a word of beckoning. He changes tone now. Last week I said that preachers need to preach the tone of the message, not just the words of the message. They need to be loyal to the actual tone of that passage. And what happens in chapter 4 is that this author changes tones. He was warning the people, don't harden your hearts. And then in chapter 4 he says, why don't you come to Jesus? So let me read it to you. He says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 to 13, he says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. But we who have believed enter that rest. As he said, as I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in the passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from His. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the Word of the God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. But let me read to the end. Since then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The way is open for us. The way is open for you. And this morning I just want to point to four things that we need to see from this passage. Number one, we need to realize what the rest of God is. There is a rest for your soul. You probably don't even know this because we live in a time where we're so used to being restless. We're so used to being busy and worrying. We don't know what it's like to be restful. That's why people want vacations and then yet they come back from vacations even more tired than they went. They seek for it, but they don't know where to find it. And then this author says, there is a rest for you. That's what verse 1 is all about. The promise of entering his rest still stands. There's such a thing as a peaceful heart. But what is this rest? And for that, we need to look to the end of this passage in verse 9 and 10. We saw this last week, but it bears repeating because it's so important. What is this Sabbath rest? What is this all about? Verse 9, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Sabbath rest is a kind of resting from your works so that you can finally worship God's works. We saw this last week. Sabbath was created so that you would stop from your work, cease from your work, and then worship God's work. That's why we're here this morning here today. 
That's why we had a good night's rest yesterday. That's why we had a prayer meeting this morning to prepare us to worship God right now. And what it says to us as human beings is that we need to recognize that we are not gods. We are not God. This is why Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. When you come into a Sabbath rest, you realize who's God. And then you realize that you are not the savior of your world. You are not the savior of your wayward child. You are not the savior of your company. You're not the savior of your daughter. You're not the savior of your friend. Jesus is. And so entering into a Sabbath rest means acknowledging God as God and acknowledging Him as the Savior. But what it also means is that we were not meant to be defined by work. We saw last week that someone who hardens his heart, is we see this in a person who begins to define himself by his work. He seeks after performance, after success, after money, after reputation to define and to give himself identity. And yet God says to this person, you were not made for work. Work was given for you. You were made for God. You know, when you see somebody seeking for their identity, seeking for meaning in their schoolwork, in their work, seeking to be defined and seeking joy in their work primarily, then you know that this person is hardening their hearts and we as Christians are called to exhort that person back. You know, the irony is that any one of us who has ever tried to seek for that kind of meaning in work, we've known that our work has let us down. You seek to find meaning and value and identity in your school, you know that it lets you down. Because you were not created to be fulfilled and defined by work. God tells you He instilled the Sabbath so that you would be defined by Him. You know the word Sabbath or the word rest actually literally means to stop. Just to stop. And it's interesting here that we're told in chapter 4 here that the reason Sabbath exists was because God rested on the seventh day. Isn't that interesting? God is omnipotent. He has all the energy in the world, and yet it says that He rested. Why would that be? Why would God need to rest? The reason God rests is not because He's tired. God rests because He ceases from His work because He has finished His work. God rests from His work because His work is now completed. And then on the seventh day, He does something very special. Genesis chapter 2 verse 3 says, On the seventh day, God blessed that day and made it holy. Who did He do that for? That was not done for God Himself. He blessed the seventh day and made the seventh day holy for you and me. That's why Jesus said in Matthew and Mark 2, He says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you so that you would stop and then you would worship God's work. It's not because you're tired that you have a day of Sabbath. It's not because you need rest so that you can do more work from Monday to Saturday. You stop because you need to remind yourself that you belong to God. That God is the one who defines you. You're not defined by your work. You're not defined by your family. You are defined by God. This is totally countercultural to the world. The world measures your value by who you, how you perform, how you succeed. But God measures your value by who you belong to, by who you are a family of. So you have to stop to recognize who you belong to. This is what Sabbath rest is. And there is this rest. That's the first point. There is a rest open for your soul. 
Number two, you can enter that rest. And you can enter it today. Today, if you hear His voice, you can enter into that rest. Verse 6 and 7 tell us something quite confusing here. But the point is actually quite clear. Let me read it to you again. The author says, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, for those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today is the day for you to enter the rest, not any other day. Today is that day. You know, Paul says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of God's favor over you. Not tomorrow. Not yesterday. Today. And right now, God is trying to speak that word to you right at this moment, saying, why don't you come to me for rest? Why don't you lay the works of your hands down and then worship me? Why don't you lay your worries down so that you would take up my yoke, an easy yoke, and bear it with me? Look at verse 1. He says that the promise of entering His rest stands. It stands. That's why we ought to fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. At this point, He's not trying to threaten these people anymore. He's not trying to change the hearts of these people. He's trying to say to this, to this congregation that if you don't enter this rest, you, 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 will, you need to fear something. You need to fear because if you don't enter this rest, you're in fact not entering into Jesus. If you don't find rest for your soul, you are not actually saved. There's a kind of fear that is healthy in your life. There really is. We are called to be fearless people apart from one kind of fear. If we fear God, then we will be fearless. But if we don't fear God, we will be lifeless. We will be joyless. We will be restless. We will be helpless. But if you fear God, you will not fear anything. And here in this passage, if you will fear not entering that rest, then you will actually enter that rest. That's the paradox here. There is a kind of fear that sets you free from all other fears. If you fear the greatest thing there is to fear, then everything else doesn't compare and you have nothing else to fear. You and I, we know this because you remember as a child walking with your father or your mother on the street and then you felt your father yank at your arm really hardly and then hold you tightly and then sternly speak to you say, saying, do not ever run into the street again or you will die. Remember when your parents said that to you? Nobody would ever say to that parent, you're constraining that child. You're ruining that child. You're not giving that child freedom. Nobody would ever say that because there is a kind of fear that sets you free from all other fears. That's why Paul says we ought to be working our salvation with fear and trembling. We need to be fearful of losing our salvation. This doesn't mean that we don't know that we are saved. That's not what it means. It means that we need to be cautious. We need to be alert. We need to be looking at our hearts and seeing where it is at this very moment. You know, you can ask yourself that question right now. Where is your heart right now? Where are you turning to for rest? Who are you turning to for identity? Where are you going to for joy? There's a kind of fear that will set you free from all the fears. And here, it is a fear that you will not enter that rest. This is not just about avoiding hell. Okay, This is not just about getting into heaven at the end of your life and avoiding hell. This is not what Christianity is about. 
It's about finding rest right now. Knowing who you belong to right now. You know, as scary as hell is and as terrifying as it is, if you don't know who you are right now, then you are living hell. You are living a living hell. Because not knowing who you are and not knowing who you belong to is drives, is what drives people to suicide. Not knowing why you live and who you live for and why you were created and who you belong to is what drives people into depression. And then they try to alleviate that depression with drugs and they, that, that will not bring them out of the depression. I'm not saying you shouldn't be taking drugs. We need to be dealing with our fallen nature in a very wholesome way so that we take medication alongside of spiritual medication. But we need to realize that the root of our being is a deep desire to know who we are. Animals don't feel this. Animals don't have existential crises. Your dog and your cat never cares about who they are and who they belong to, but you care. Because you were made for eternity. The Bible tells us that God has set eternity in our hearts. There's a capacity inside of you that your dog and your cat doesn't have. There's something in, inside of you, a hunger inside of you, that, that needs to be filled by God. This is what the rest is about. About going to Jesus and then finding who you are. It's not just about avoiding hell at the end. It's about entering into His life now. Today, if you hear His voice, why don't you enter into that rest? Number three. You enter God's rest by means of faith. And this is the heart of the message today. If you forget anything else, I just, I just ask and I pray right now for five minutes, you will pay attention to what we're saying. You enter God's rest by faith. Okay. Look at verse two. The good news came to us just as to them, as to the people who fell in the wilderness. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. The most important thing we need to know about how to enter in Jesus, into, into Jesus' rest is to know that it is done through faith. We need to understand what it means to believe in Jesus. Most of us here are baptized and confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But what does it really mean to love and to believe in Jesus? What does it mean? I already gave you a hint of this because in Matthew eleven twenty eight he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me. And then John six thirty five says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. You hear that? Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Let me give you another one. John chapter 7, on the last day of the feast, Jesus stares right into the eyes of the Pharisees, people who are about to kill him. And then he says to these people, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Do you hear that? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? It has nothing to do with admitting that he is the Son of God. We know this because James tells us that though you may admit Jesus is the Son of God, so what? Even Satan does it and he shudders. It has absolutely nothing to do with just admitting facts, like saying that Mars is the fourth planet, or saying that today is a sunny day. It's not just about admitting and believing facts. Listen to these words of Jesus. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. If anyone comes to me, he will not hunger. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What it means 
to believe in Jesus is to go to Jesus for the satisfaction of your soul. I cannot say this enough because this is the heart of Christianity. You may have been baptized already and never have gone to Jesus for your satisfaction. That's a frightening thing. To believe in Jesus means to go to Him to eat and then to drink and then to be satisfied. It's all about happiness. It's all about satisfaction. Christianity is not about following commandments. Those are, those are the consequence of you being satisfied. Someone who is satisfied will obey the commandments. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. You will obey my word. The obedience comes from the satisfaction, not the other way around. If you try to live the Christian life by using your will, by obeying, obeying God's word so that you would be satisfied, you got it all wrong. We are called to go to Jesus to be satisfied and then live as obedient sons and daughters. It's all about being happy, but in Jesus. We studied this two years ago, right? When we looked at Desiring God by John Piper. When you are happy in God, He is glorified in you. You are glorifying God by enjoying Him. Or the way Piper puts it, God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. And you can test yourself in this. You can examine yourself in this. When was the last time you went to Jesus to eat, to drink? When was the last time you went to Jesus to seek for rest? Nothing, this is not about reading the Bible, folks. It's not even just about praying or singing. It's about being still and going to God, and Jesus, and just saying, Jesus, can you satisfy my soul? You know, yesterday, I had a board meeting at 9.30, Isaiah Fellowship at 11, a couple fellowship at 2, worship night from 7 to 9, and then when I went home, I had to continue preparing the sermon. And right before the worship night, I told Kate, we were just standing here, and I said to her, I am so exhausted right now. And then we just said, you know what, but God is good, and we just trust that even as we're worshiping, we will be restored. And, you know, yesterday night, as we were singing, though my body was totally exhausted, I felt my heart being lifted up. You know, that's what St. Augustine was talking about when he said that, that we were made for you, Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. If you're worshiping and you're not allowing your heart to enter into Jesus and letting Jesus enter into you, then you won't find that rest. That's, that's why people sing songs without passion. That's why people pray you know, repetitive prayers without their heart. Because what, what it takes for you to enter into Jesus' rest is a kind of stillness. It's a, it's a kind of quietness. I said that last week when, when, when the authors wrote, be still and know that I'm God, the literal translation there is, be quiet and know that I'm God. Shut up with your mouth and know that I'm God. Maybe it's, it's, it's shut down with our brains and Know that I am God. When was the last time you, you sat before God still and received nourishment for your soul? You know, one of the biggest tragedies for the Protestant church, because we want to be people who are not bound by the law, right? The law, the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. And so we embrace that doctrine and we say, we don't want to be bound by any law of the Old Testament. We're free people. And that's true. That's a good thing. But don't let that freedom become license for you to neglect your need to be quiet. You know, as much as we kind of look at the Jews and we, we kind of see them as legalistic people, well, at least on a Friday night and a whole day on Saturday, 
they really do rest. They really do sit down and think and meditate on God, even though they're not meditating on Jesus. That's the biggest tragedy for them. But you know what the tragedy for us is? Is that people who are free from all these laws use that freedom for sin. You take that freedom that Jesus bought for you on the cross and you use it to look at pornography. You look, use it to waste away your days on dramas. You use it to play video games without ceasing. And you will not spend five minutes a day resting on it. You know, sometimes I wonder if it weren't better if some of us were under the law. At least we would actually be under His will. So we need to be building Sabbath into your rest. You know, Sunday mornings are just a taste of the kind of Sabbath that you want to experience throughout your week. I put an article in your bulletins about what it means to enter into rest. It's not just about a Sabbath day. It's not just Sundays. It's a Sabbath heart. It's a being an attitude, an orientation towards God. You know, when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest, that come to me is a present tense. It's a present commandment. It doesn't mean just you come to Jesus at the beginning of your baptism, and then for the rest of your life, you're on your own. It means that you come to him every single day. And so to be a Christian means to go to him every single day to eat and drink every day so that your soul would be rejoicing and be full. Do you know, you want to know if you're really saved? You want to know if you're really a true believer? Well, ask yourself this. Are, are, are you getting hungry, more and more hungry for Jesus? That's all you have to ask. Are you getting more and more hungry for Jesus? Do you find the appetites of your soul growing more and more for Jesus? That's how you see if you are growing in your faith. If you find yourself more and more desperate for Jesus, you can be assured that that's a good place to be. Keep there. Keep on on that position. You know that you are a true believer when you want Him and you want His Word more and more, more than all the things of this world. That's what it means to really believe. You know, we have some doctors and pharmacists among us here one of the funniest things about doctors and patients is that so many doctors, they write out prescriptions for their patients and the patients do not follow the prescriptions. Why don't they do that? Because they don't believe the doctor. They don't really believe him. Because if you really believed in your doctor, you really abided in your doctor's word, you would follow those prescriptions to the letter. What it means to believe in Jesus means that when he says, come to me and I will give you rest, you really go to him. Every day for rest. We need to build that into our lives. We need to be building that into our lives, people. Sunday mornings right now, every 8.30 to 9.15, we're spending 45 minutes to do nothing else but to pray so that we would build a stillness into our hearts so that when we sing, we really mean it. When we listen to the Word of God, our hearts are ready for it. I asked that question last week. What were you doing this morning? What were you doing last night? It takes a certain kind of preparation for you to enter that rest. And it leads me to this next point and the last point. Because it says something very, very special here in verse 11. The author says that if we want to enter in this rest... We need to strive to enter into it. Look at verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. That's a really weird thing to say. Because it seems kind of counterintuitive, right? Rest is a kind of peacefulness. It's a kind of relaxed nature. And yet the author says you need to make every effort striving to get into that rest. You know, the image he has here is as a marathon runner. He's going to use this image throughout the book of Hebrews, but then in chapter 11 and 12, he's going to really develop that image. The image here is of a runner who's running towards the goal. And the goal is Sabbath. 
And that marathon runner is doing everything he can to get into that rest. Marathon runners do not run with a backpack on their shoulders. That would be the most idiotic thing to do for a marathon runner. He takes off the weight. He wears very light shorts. He doesn't even carry much water on him. He just runs towards that goal. And the author tells us, he's going to tell us throughout this whole book, but especially in chapter 12, he says, why don't you take off your sins? Take off the things that are bothering you. Make every effort to get sin out of your life so that you can enter into that rest. You know, the life of a Christian is a life of faith, but it is a fight for faith. It is war. It is a constant war. But it is a joyful and an easy war because it is a war that is fought by God and that is won by God. C.S. Lewis once said that the Christian life is at once the hardest life and at once the easiest life. It's hard because there will be persecutions, but it is easy because we know our end goal is beautiful. It's hard because we need to struggle with our own wills and lay down ourselves, but it's easy because Jesus helps us do it. We need to be striving and making every effort to get into this rest. One of the things that keeps us from rest is sin that holds us back. I know many of us struggle with hidden sin. And some of us take it lightly because we think that just because everyone is doing it, it's okay. It's just a part of natural growing pains. Pornography is so prevalent, therefore, it's okay. Lusting after women or men is okay because it's so prevalent. It's just being a human being. It's okay to disobey my parents because, you know, They're not the boss of me. It's okay to lay aside God's Sabbath day on Sundays to do other things because, well, it's okay, I'm not under law. I'm under grace. People who are bound by sin will never enter that rest. And what Jesus is saying here, He says, why don't you take those sins, confess them to me, and then exchange them for my rest. That's why there's this really peculiar two verses in verse 12 and 13. He says, let me read from verse 11. He says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. What he means here is this. When you strive to enter that rest, you do it because you know that God sees right to your heart. He knows everything that's in your heart right now. He knows what you're thinking about right now, whether you're distracted or whether you're focused on the Word here. He knows everything. You are totally naked before Him. And because you are totally naked before Him, you are totally vulnerable before Him. That's what the Word of God does. When you read the Word of God, it's like a light that shines right into your dirty and sinful heart. And it exposes every sin and every darkness. It's like a sword that opens our whole bodies so that all of our organs are before God. Everything is exposed to God. The image here is of a man who has been totally stripped naked to stand before the judgment of God. That's what it's like to be under the Word of God. And he's saying there here that we need to strive to enter that rest because if we don't, then we will stand there totally naked and not be able to give an account for why we are not in Jesus. But you know what? As a Christian, we are not naked. As a Christian, 
when you enter into Christ, when you enter into His rest, the Bible tells us that you actually put on a set of clothing. You actually are clothed with something. And Paul tells us in Galatians, in Romans, that when you enter into Jesus, you are clothed with Christ. So that you no longer stand before God totally naked. When God sees you, He doesn't see a naked person. He sees His Son. And the reason why His Son's clothing over you is a beautiful clothing, is a beautiful Son, is because this is the Jesus who was stripped totally naked to enter that cross, enter into your unrest so that you would be clothed. You know, the Word of God actually represents the judgment of God. And we are the ones who are standing under that judgment totally naked. But, you know, when you enter into Christ, He takes your place, literally. By all historical accounts, Jesus was stripped completely naked. And then the cross was placed at the highways of Jerusalem so that everyone would see the shame And that Jesus, stripped totally naked, hanging on the cross, dying and then resurrecting, is the body that you place on yourself when you enter into Him. This is the most beautiful thing that has ever happened to you, Christian. You took off your old self, and then you put on the body of Christ, so that when you stand before the Word of God, The word of God that was supposed to be judgment now is the word of God of welcoming. Now is the word of God that brings you rest. So again I say to you, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Listen to Jesus' words. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. As we pray now, and I ask the, as I ask the worship team to come and lead us into the last response hymn, I want to speak to those who in this room right now have never given themselves over to Jesus. People in this room who have never gone to Jesus. You may have been baptized, but you have not gone to Jesus. You don't know what it means to find rest. And so I'm pleading with you right now just to say to him, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm coming to you now in faith. I'm coming to seek that rest and would you give it to me? I'm coming to eat and drink. I'm coming to be satisfied. And I'm coming to believe. I also want to speak to those who, for you it's been maybe ten years since you've really tasted Jesus. There were times in your life, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, where you really felt that rest that Jesus had. But because of the distractions of this world, because of the desires and the temptations of this world, it's been years since you've rested in Him. I'm just praying that today, if you hear His voice, why don't you go to Him? Heavenly Father, You are beckoning Your children home right now. You are saying to each one of us sitting here, come to my son and then he will give you rest. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.